Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por invitarme a hablar sobre Oracle Apex en el evento virtual de hoy. Ya sé que sea un administrador, administrador de bases de datos o un desarrollador. Espero que mi presentación lo inspire a encontrar nuevas formas de usar Apex en su lugar de trabajo. Por favor, espere sus preguntas hasta que haya completado mi presentación. And that's as much Spanish as you're getting out of me today, folks. Sorry. Uh, I had to practice that a few times. Uh, my spoken Spanish is not the best in the world, I'll be honest. Uh, and I hope uh, that you're going to enjoy the rest of my presentation. Uh, which is entitled Politics Ain't Beanbag, and you can read the rest. I'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, but I've been doing information technology for about four decades. I've been an Oracle DBA since 2001. I have uh, several OCPs and I am and also an uh, Autonomous Data Warehouse Cloud Specialist certified. Been an Oracle Ace Director since 2014. I've touched just about every continent except Antarctica during tours. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, uh, my newer role, I'm not pitching for, uh, you know, to, to take anything away from our community today here, but I also work a lot with OD Tug. I'm the Oracle Database Community Technical Lead uh, or Technical Liaison, I should say Technical Lead, excuse me, uh, Community Leader. And if you're interested in submitting articles uh, to us, to get some penetration into North America, please feel free to do so. We have quite a few articles uh, that we've been uh, gathering from authors. You don't have to be an Oracle ace to uh, actually present or anything like that. I will mention I have my last part of my article here, part four on autonomous database and machine learning. I'm gonna mention some of the techniques in my presentation today uh, about how that all came together. Uh, as you might know, I've spoken at quite a few uh, conferences. In fact, I was just looking through pictures from 2018 when I was in the Latin America tour. Remember when we could travel? Uh, well, when Americans could travel, North Americans, Americans, U USA citizens could travel. Uh, yeah, I do too. I haven't been out of the country or he heck on a presentation since I went to Israel to present in February. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you have any questions at the end of this, you can reach me at this email address. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. I usually have something interesting about anything from politics to Oracle. Uh, and uh, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Enough about me. What does the title really mean? Well, you may or may not know this. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, which is a huge Midwestern city. We used to be the second largest city in the country until Los Angeles, California overtook us. This is our city's flag with four stars. Uh, the f three of the four stars, the ones most to the uh, right, represent the Chicago fire in 1871 that almost destroyed our whole city. Uh, the next one was for the Columbian Exposition of 1893. And finally, the, the uh, fourth star to the right is, uh, represents the 1933 World's Fair. I'll tell you more about the leftmost star in just a minute. But the title of our presentation, uh, Beanbag, what's a beanbag, right? Well, it's actually a couple kids here in Chicago. This is in a park in Chicago playing beanbag. Uh, it, it's a little cloth bag usually filled with beans or sometimes dried corn. That's why we call it also cornhole. And the idea is you throw the bag over, toss it, right? Sometimes called beanbag toss, and you try to get it in the hole of your opponents, right? And the reason that's important is this guy, Peter Finley Dunn. He was a, a writer, uh, Irish American writer, and he wrote for the Chicago uh, Herald American and then finally the Chicago Tribune. And he had a character named Mr. Dooley. Mr. Dooley was an Irish American uh, character and he had all kinds of observations about things from everything from the price of bread to politics. And one of his key phrases is politics ain't beanbag. In other words, what he means is politics is a nasty, tough, hard business. And for my fellow South Americans, if you haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in the United States, you haven't been able to see 
how tough politics are these days. We're in some very interesting places in the United States, some place I never thought I would be. And just as an example, by the way, Chicago politics can get pretty nasty. It ain't beanbagging. By the way, that same phrase, politics ain't beanbag, was the uh, phrase of this guy, Harold Washington, our first African-American uh, uh, mayor of the city. Uh, Harold Washington was a United States Congress person uh, and eventually uh, did become the mayor uh, after the first leftmost star, 150 years after the first settler, who also was African American, a guy named Jean Baptiste Pointe du Sable. And that's what that leftmost star meant. It only took 150 years for us to get an African American mayor. Yeah, uh, politics ain't beanbag in the city. And part of that story, by the way, uh, when Harold Washington ran as a Democrat and won that election, right? He ran as a Democrat, but suddenly people that had been Democrats their entire lives and mainly white voters suddenly became Republicans because they couldn't see themselves voting for a black man. Politics ain't beanbag for sure. Times have changed in our city. We now have uh, actually our first female African-American mayor, but it still is that, whoops, sorry, down and dirty. And one of the things I, I, the reason I like talking about politics is because we've all dealt with them our whole lives, even since grade school, early school, right? We've always uh, been involved in elections in one way or another. And I find it a fascinating topic. Governing people is the hardest thing that humans have ever accomplished. We don't always get it right, but it also has a lot of excellent use cases. And so one of the things I've learned is how flexible and how perfect the autonomous database is for many of these solutions. Uh, by way of background, I'm gonna be talking about a campaign, you know, an electoral campaign for Congress that I'm actually working on right now. And I found Apex to be unbelievably flexible and useful for everything that I've done. The neat thing is if I've got an autonomous database at the center of everything I'm doing, whether it's an ATP or an ADW instance, right? Uh, I already have an Apex environment. I don't have to install ORDs on a separate server. I'm ready to go. And I can even import data and even applications directly into Oracle, even if it's just a simple Google Sheet or Excel spreadsheet. The other thing I really like about Apex is that the REST API makes it really easy to build applications, not just for reading, right, select with a get call, but also for updating and doing large reads and writes via post, as well as inserting rows with create, deleting rows with delete, and updating rows with update. Oracle built this fantastic API for doing that against database tables. And guess what? You can use similar APIs from other applications to do exactly the same thing. And finally, here's where things really matter. We're becoming a digitally driven society. You cannot stop this, right? This is where things are going right now. And uh, I found this out for real during this campaign, but I've been pursuing this for almost the last two years. Using machine learning techniques makes digitally driven, getting to digitally driven much simpler than we've ever been able to believe, right? And more and more organizations, especially with COVID-19, are looking specifically at ways to become digitally driven. And the ones that haven't are falling by the wayside. So if you're not on board with machine learning and analytics, you will be. I hate to say it, or you'll be out of a job. And here's what's changing. Uh, I've been reading a book called Range by David Epstein. Fantastic book. Uh, one of the things, that, one of the observations, the first few chapters are that Nobel laureates, not noble, that's something else. Nobel laureates are 20 times more likely to have a different hobby, something to take their minds off of work, right? And if you're a DBA or a developer or desarrollador, I love that term in Spanish. I feel so sexy when I say it. I love that phrase, you know? It sounds like I'm working in a novela, right? Uh, but anyway, to be serious, right? I have a lot of different hobbies. I have this election as one of my hobbies. I do some martial arts as a hobby, right? The point is that 
generalism, right, is the new normal. Another great story that I love about uh, uh, American ingenuity, and I mean American, North and South American, and Central American as well, ingenuity, is this guy. He was the commander of forces, American forces, at a city called Bastogne in 1944, December. And the Germans had surrounded the American 101st Airborne, and they offered them very generous terms of surrender. And this general, General McAuliffe, sent one word as a response, nuts. He probably would have sent another word, a swear word, but he didn't swear. He also told his troops, we have the enemy exactly where we want them. We can now attack in any direction. And whether you're a developer or a DBA, you're in exactly the right spot. Right now, you can attack in any direction because if data is the new oil and it's miners, it's pupper outers, our data scientists, especially if you're an Oracle DBA, you're even an apps DBA, but even if you're a developer, you're uniquely positioned to support them. And if you haven't done anything with machine learning or algorithms or predictions or forecasting, a good idea of where things are going is, to, is this book, The Signal and the Noise. Nate Silver wrote this several years back. I think we're in edition three now. Pick it up, read it. It's fascinating reading. Uh, but I recommend becoming a generalist. Specialization is dead. It truly is. And here's why. The converged database. Oracle's vision for the future, and I talk a lot with my colleagues, some uh, that have left companies and have gone to work with Oracle, that what's going on? Where are things going in the future? And at the center of all this is an ADW or ATP instance, or as you may have heard this week, a new type of database, autonomous database called the Autonomous JSON database or AJD, right? And the idea here is that we can handle from the left side of the screen, any data from anywhere in any format, including JSON documents, handle them and store them securely and efficiently inside some sort of data storehouse and leverage business analytics like Oracle Analytics Cloud, Oracle Machine Learning, OML, which is built into every single autonomous database, and even Apex. And especially with Apex, as I'm going to show you some things a little, little bit here, anybody can take advantage of this, including business leaders. Sure, they're the ones that want to know what's going on. But so can analysts, data scientists, and of course, desarrolladores right? The developers of the world. So that's the big picture. Let's dive in. About two years back, sorry, I needed a little bit of lemonade. I joined a congressional campaign in 2018. It was the start of what's been called here in the North Americas, uh, in the United States, I should say, the blue wave. And the gentleman that was running for Congress was running against a Republican. Hopefully you know a little bit about our, our political situation here. We have two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, the current Senate and uh, President, President, President Trump is a Republican. The congressional district that my candidate I decided to work with, he was a, a Democrat. That seat had been held for 35 years by a Republican. Our candidate came in 12 to 13 points down. He won by about four. We had an enormous amount of ground to cover. And I remember in the first few months of the campaign, uh, as we got started, I was trying to help them out. And I built some applications for them. It turns out they didn't use all of them. They had their own opinions on it. This time around, I'm still working with the campaign because our guy did win. Things are a little different. They're a little more open to hearing more about how I can help them. But I realized that organized campaigns are an oxymoron. They're, 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 they're a conflict in meeting, right? Kind of like military intelligence, as the joke goes. Managing a campaign organization is a big job. Also, one of the major things that campaigns do, besides ask for money, at least here in the United States, is canvas voters. Talk to voters. Ask them via telephone, via email, via text message, uh, knocking on doors. Remember when we could do that? <laughs> Ask them, would you like to vote for our candidate? Let me tell you more about our candidate. 
And we're humans. We got to know where we are in the hierarchy. Who do I report to? Who do I need to ask? Who do I need to supervise? And finally, am I getting coverage in all the geographic areas that I need to? Because here's what the big deal was. We needed to be able to figure out voters and their enthusiasm for the campaign. I grabbed some data. This is not live data. I don't have any live data from the campaign. I'm not going to share it. That would be unethical. And also, I don't have it. <laughs> I'm not going to share it on these screens with you. But I built a little database inside an ATP instance. And I populated it with the around 280 to 300,000 voters that could vote in the next campaign. And I built a parent-child relationship in Apex. This is a subset of the actual application that I'm sharing with you here. Here's the parent, somebody named Marcus Chuprina, probably one of my countrymen. And every time that someone had reached out to Marcus on the campaign, I noticed a couple of times things didn't go that well. He threatened us on porch. And what he threatened us with was stop bothering me. Stop bothering me. We got, I think, actually, I think we had gotten in touch with his grandfather or something. He's like, quit calling here. You do have that happen, right? Those kinds of things do happen. But we needed to be able to see these data. I put these screens together with five, five mouse clicks in one weekend. And then I spent the next weekend reading the documentation to understand what I did. But that's how easy it is to build stuff in Apex. Check this one out. Here's another thing I built. I also needed to build out a list of, here are the people that are in the campaign at the highest level, next highest level, and which volunteers report to people. Remember? Who do I report to? Who have I got to take this to? I need help. Who's my supervisor? Who's reporting to me? I was able to build this tree view with a little bit of experimentation. It took some time and some documentation reading in about a few hours, about four hours, once I understood what I was doing. And then I was even able to see, for example, a particular committee lead, a guy named Charles Barnes. Again, this is not real data. These are simple, simplified and sample data. How many people as campaign organizers, this guy has three people reporting to him, and how they're doing overall and how their volunteers are doing out in the field. This particular woman, Priscilla Champion, has over 18,000 voters that have been canvassed in some way, shape, or form. That's pretty good. And how uh, enthusiastic are the individual, uh, or not individually, but collectively, how enthusiastic are people about the candidate? Right now it's running about 2.99, which is right down the middle, average. But I can also drill into, for Priscilla, for example, the people that are reporting to her. And as you can see, as we got closer to the election, which happens in November here in the United States, more and more people were actively canvassing voters. So I've got a great little mini dashboard here at three different levels of the campaign. Not too shabby. And again, I can drill into each individual volunteer and see how many. This guy's been busy. 6,000 different voters have been canvassed and how well they're doing, right? Maybe we give this guy a special award. Uh, let me tell you, the elections are run on shoestring budgets. There ain't too much else there. About the best I might be able to do is an extra donut for him or a cup of coffee. But usually that's enough. Volunteers are motivated. That's one of the things I found out. So this is what we basically had to go with. And then my wife, who is also a campaign volunteer, started canvassing. Again, this is two years ago, knocking on doors. And I said, show me which applications you're using. And she went, Puh, are you kidding me? We don't have an application. All we have are a bunch of maps on paper. And I said, oh, hon, let me build you an application. No one decided to use this. Again, not sure why. A lot of times people are afraid of things they don't understand. But this would have been a superior application and anyway, it was a great use case. I actually built a small, mobile, capable application. I built a little screen that said, hey, pick your name. Once you've picked your name, whatever volunteer you were, I would randomly pick five voters for you to contact. Now, this is an early prototype, but you can see that they range across several different locations, but they're all chosen randomly 
basically that's what it was. When you finished canvassing one of them, and here I picked uh, this particular person, uh, uh, the second one in the list, I can actually just click in here. Hey, this guy was this person, this lady, this man was very positive. They wanted to volunteer. They were actually interested in giving us money and they're excited about the campaign. And yes, please do contact, right? And we said, yes, follow up. None of this was actively available inside the applications they were using. They simply didn't have time in the 2018 campaign to use this. And just to prove to you that these aren't just screenshots, I'm gonna come over here and actually log into my application. Here's my application in Apex right now. And so I just need to log in real quickly. And one of the things I wanted to share with you that's pretty cool is uh, that campaign organization screen that I was telling you about. So here I am logging into it. Presumably it's coming up. There's the same one I just showed you, right? Here's where I can actually drill down into the different people as I was sharing with you here. But I've got a lot more things. This is version 2.0 of my application. And one of the ones I'm gonna share with you real quickly here is something I'm really excited about. This is actually an application of machine learning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now in my presentation. But I've actually built inside this a machine learning implementation looking for flippable voters. What's that all about? Well, here's the deal. By the way, this is the actual map of our electoral district. And as you can see, it's, uh, you may not know this term, if you uh, may not have heard it, it's called gerrymandering. And a gerrymandered district is one that's been drawn so that the one political party, typically one or the other, Democrat or Republican, has an excellent chance of holding on to the district for many, many years. In fact, gerrymandering uh, is one of the reasons that we have had such a disconnect of our United States electorate from its uh, government representatives. As I mentioned, this campaign uh, that we had in 2018, the gentleman that was there before had served six consecutive terms, 12 years, and he had gone 12 years uh, I think we, we computed it that he had gone over 3,000 days, almost 10 years, without having a public meeting with his constituents, believe it or not. That's one of the reasons we were able to eject him and pick a new candidate, right? But we needed to actually penetrate this district. It's not trivial. It spans five different counties and 50-plus separate towns ranging everything from Hispanic voters, Asian American, Indian and Pakistani voters, uh, uh, also uh, quite a few African American voters, not huge amounts, but significant amounts. And of course, a lot of white voters, very different views, uh, a huge difference uh, disparity in terms of income as well in some of the areas to the west part of this particular district. So that was one of the things that I was tasked with. Another one, actually I tasked myself with it, to be honest with you. Another one that I had was trying to figure out how to more efficiently manage the volunteers, right? Especially for things like getting merchandise out to people. One of the things we do here in the US, I'm not sure if you do that in other areas of, of the world, we put out signs on our lawns to say, hey, I'm for this candidate. And so as a result of that, we wanted to make sure that we could do that much more effectively because in the 2018 campaign, let me tell you, we were doing that at the last minute, figuring out where to put things and who should deliver the signs to voters. But that was 2018. This time around, we had to figure out a way to do it with regards to COVID-19 and getting volunteers that could mask up and go deliver signs. And we needed to do that so that we didn't burn people out, not use one person to deliver 100 signs, but five people to deliver 10 signs each. And finally, hey, we're reaching out to voters. We can't go knocking on doors. This is the most difficult part of any campaign in the United States right now, and any, frankly, any place in the world where we used to go knock on doors. We now have to rely on virtual methods. One of the ones that we're doing here in the United States is something called voter tripling where someone will go, yeah, 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 I really like your candidate. That's great. Could you find three friends 
that would vote for them as well. We can't go knock on their doors. Just tell me their first names. We'll find them and we'll contact them. And then I need to follow up with the contributor of those three names. So as you can see, things have changed because all of our plans of how we're going to reach out to voters have completely changed. And if you think about it, a campaign ain't much different than running a business these days, especially in the time of COVID. One of the things I realized right off the bat, because since 2018, some things have changed. I've got an autonomous database layer that's always free. Not only is it always free, it's secure. And not only that, machine learning, analytics, and you may or may not be aware of this, spatial and graph features are built into the Oracle database for free. You don't even need an autonomous database to take advantage of that, right? But if you have a standard DB instance, spatial and graphics, all the stuff you need for GIS is free. By the way, for our campaign, we did not have an enormous amount of data. So the 20 gigabytes worth of storage that we would need or that we would have to access as part of our autonomous database was more than enough. And finally, once again, security is a must. We knew that this time around, our Republican uh, colleagues, <laughs> our, the, the guys not Democrats, were going to come after this district. And they have. They've poured money from outside of our district into this race, and they're trying to make it competitive. Therefore, we need to be paranoid. We need to be careful about who's looking at what data and making sure that we restrict it. You know, it's interesting because I talked to other campaigns, sorry, I talked to other campaigns and guess what? They're still running on AWS. They're running on Redshift. And by the way, I was looking at some documents on that. Redshift is not secure by default. You can make it secure, but an Oracle autonomous database is secure by default. You can't even create one without an SSH key. You may or may not know that. So let me show you some really neat stuff. One of the things we needed to do was figure out who needed what merchandise and who would deliver it. So I went into much more detail, by the way, in my tech acceleration article, part four. I'll have a link to that at the end of this. But guess what I was tasked with? Dear Jim, can you help us figure this out? Can you figure out who should deliver these merchandise? And I said, great, where can I get the data from? Can I go to one of the portals that has all this information? Ah, no, 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 no. We're going to do it securely with Excel spreadsheets. And I went, oh, you're kidding me, right? Excel? We're going to be passing around data with Excel. <sighs> okay, we'll limit it to a few people. Send me the Excel spreadsheets. How am I going to get this data into a database table? Well, I could do SQL loader. I could do all kinds of stuff like that. But did you know that the Oracle sample applications for Apex has a beautiful little method that lets you actually import data directly from an Excel spreadsheet. One of the tricks that we had to deal with though was that in our congressional district, we split it up, sorry about that, <laughs> bumped my microphone yet again, sorry about that, uh, into eight regions. So they would send me an Excel spreadsheet and would have three tabs on it. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Here I am in my actual application and they would send me a file that had maybe one tab in it and it would be corresponding to region one. And if I wanted to look at that data, let me just move my screen around here a little bit. There we go. I could see just by loading that up, Oh, okay, that's great. But what if they sent me one that had three tabs? As you can see here, there's just one tab. Check this out. And I just, by the way, I'm not ashamed to admit that I copied this. <laughs> this is from a, a set of requests from June 16th, right? By the way, again, this is all fake data. I don't have anybody's uh, actual data in here. There is no Boris Strelnikov living in Palatine, Illinois. Trust me on that. If I click on preview, it goes, oh, okay. Hey, region one, guess what? There's actually other regions. And I can also pull up, whoops, re let me do that again. Sorry about that. I can also pull up and automatically populate 
those data. Here it is for region eight. Notice if I change the region to region four, I get another population. If I say preview again, it should populate it. Oh gosh darn it, okay. I had that working a few seconds ago. Anyway, <laughs> let me pull that back up. Sorry, I'm, one of my events may not be firing there. No big deal. Here's region four again, there we go. Okay, there's region four, slightly different, okay? So again, I was able to do this. And by the way, there's another button here called upload that automatically loads it up into my database. But that's only part of it because one of the things I needed to do was actually say, well, this address, which again, is not a real address per se, where is it located? Because I needed to send people to deliver these particular merchandise, whatever it might be, a campaign sign, a bumper sticker, a small campaign sign, a shirt, lots of extra large shirts going out as you might see here. So what I needed to do was actually build that particular method of the application. So here's some of the detail of that. I just wanted to share that with you. But I also needed to do something else. I needed to compute a latitude and longitude for each one of those addresses. And I go, how am I going to do this? Am I going to have to use Google Maps to do that? Wait a minute. There are free geolocation APIs. One of them, by the way, is right here, MapQuest. And I experimented with this by building what's called a web source module. Here's the main thrust, folks, of Converge Database, by the way. Take the code to the data, not the data to the code. Basically, all I really needed to do was build an API that would let me put in, for example, an address. This is the actual code from my web source module coding inside Apex, and I'm calling the MapQuest API. Uh, there is the actual call to it. Uh, it's version one of their geocoding app. And I take in the address root, and all I need to do is supply with, this is a bogus value, of course, uh, for my API key, here's my personal address. Yes, this is real data. This is where I live in Bartlett, Illinois. And if I pass that in, I have to process it. So inside a um, event, right, a triggered event inside my application, I had some PL SQL code. And this is the actual implementation of that, right? I've got some variables I declared. Here is the setting of the web source uh, query itself. I'm going to use a get method to actually send the data down inside a, a store, an, uh, uh, I should say an array called WSM parameters. Here's the information that I'm going to actually get back. And I'm going to do that with getting each of the latitude, longitude, and I'll talk about quality code inside a street in just a second. I close the web source, and of course, if there's an exception, I close it just to play safe, right? Of course, I throw some error processing in here as well. We're keeping this simple, but here's the end results. Here's a latitude and longitude. Notice, by the way, it's not my address. My address is 318 Pebble Beach Lane. I'm just doing this to simulate and to show you that I can also return what's called a quality code. I happen to live on the left-hand side of the street, it's an even number. If this address actually existed, which it does not, it would likely be on the right-hand side of the street because odd numbers on our particular street are on the right-hand side. And here's something else that's really cool. Most of these geolocation uh, methods have a quality code. And in this case, it's telling me if this was perfect, if this really matched everything, it'd be a P. And it'd say, this is P for, as far as I know, perfecto, right? That it absolutely found a high quality address. However, in this case, the L indicates that it's a less than high quality address. If it's here, this is as close as I can get to it. This is the kind of stuff that really makes geolocation much simpler. Could I have used the Google Maps API? Yeah, sure, I could have. Be aware that the Google Maps API for geolocation has a limit. And once you exceed it with your API key, you will start paying. And it may, depending on how much testing you're doing, it may start costing you some serious dollars. Briefly, what I actually did implement is a different method. I found a secondary method, and here's the setup for setting that up, uh, called 
geocode io here is the call to another web source module again this is a bogus api key but i set up a separate web source module and called it in this method well why did i have to go through all this stuff and why did i have to let me go back one small slide here why did i have to do all this stuff because for this particular request i'm sending in 60 to 100 separate addresses at a time using a post method. I'm actually building a JSON document and sending that in to this particular API. What do I get back out? More details on my four, fourth part of my article series, right? But what I actually get back out is another JSON document that I also needed to parse. And in my actual document, my actual, I should say my, my fourth part of my series, I actually show you all the code that I implemented to do that. So yeah, there's some really neat stuff in here with Apex JSON. I can use Apex JSON and other JSON tools to parse JSON output as well as build JSON input. Pretty sick stuff. Finally, to close the loop. I mentioned this a little bit before. I showed you that one screen I had. Let me go back to that one screen that I had here for just a second. Remember I said that I had done some analysis on what are called flippable voters. I'm gonna share this with you right now. This actually is the result of a machine learning algorithm called Decision Tree. And what I'm showing you here is a series of data across 30 quantiles and the probability threshold and cumulative gain and so forth that are produced from a machine learning algorithm called decision tree. And I'm, I'm computing here what's called lift for flippable voters. By the way, check this out. If I wanted to change the number of quantiles and rebuild the model on the fly, I'm actually executing code right now to build a new subset of this model now not spread across 30 quantiles, but just 20. How is that even happening? Because, back to my presentation. Sorry, my throat runs dry. <laughs> Apex can access the same objects that you've built either using Oracle Machine Learning and or Analytic Cloud. Now, Oracle Analytic Cloud's a little bit better at graphic representation than is Oracle Machine Learning so far. In my opinion, Apex has some really nice reporting tool sets, great reporting tool sets actually, right? Interactive reports, et cetera, but some pretty robust graphic tool sets. And I'll share that with you in just a second. In fact, I just did. I showed you that I did a simple graph, but I was also able to seamlessly integrate with those objects because they're built into the database schema for gosh sakes. That's the power behind Apex when we use it in concert with machine learning algorithms. Now, the four-part article series I did actually dove into this topic much more deeply and said, here's my problem. I need to find people that might, might consider voting for my candidate based on their declared primary affiliation. When we vote in primary elections, which are the precursor to the general election, we are required in my state to declare as either a Republican, Democrat, or independent voter. So I don't know how you voted or who you voted for, but I know that you told me you wanted to vote on that slate of candidates. So I actually built in that article series and using these methods, I actually used the decision tree method, which is right here, um, I used a machine learning algorithm to figure out whether or not I had a good model for flippable voters. By the way, this is a live link. If you ever want to learn more about machine learning, and you should, there are about two dozen different algorithms that are built into the Oracle database. Why build algorithms and, and import data into whatever format? when you can take the code to the data, right? That's the beautiful thing here. So again, by the way, if you ever need to convince somebody in your company that Oracle is a decent tool for machine learning, 
get this cheat sheet and say, what would you like to do? Where would you like to go today? Here's what I recently showed you, right? I built the cumulative lift for each set of voters and found where the voters are and how accurate, by the way, that's what these quantile data here represent. How accurate is the model? I didn't have time to prepare that for you, but I just wanted to share with you that I was actually able to figure out how many false positives and false negatives were determined via my decision tree algorithm and model right? So again, I might use OML to do some of that. I might use Oracle Analytics Cloud to do some of the uh, uh, deeper analysis if I'm a citizen scientist and not quite a data scientist, right? But I can also use Apex to represent everything that I've done inside the machine learning algorithms. One other thing I can do, remember I talked about this? I said, hey, I need to know where the people are that are requesting signs and requesting merchandise. I want to give a shout out to Jeffrey Kemp, who until about two weeks ago was an Oracle ACE as part of the ACE program and recently joined Oracle. Jeffrey, great job. <laughs> he has an excellent Google Maps API plugin. It takes a matter of minutes to install this plugin. And once I had it, I built a little query from my voter merch requests table. And with a few mouse clicks, I can also set all kinds of neat stuff, including the initial center of my map, which of course I would rather have centered on the area that I'm most interested in, my sixth district of the, Illinois, of the state of Illinois, when the map comes up. Well, that's what actually comes up, folks. It's an extremely simple example, but you know what else? By the way, this is the link to that set of uh, uh, Apex plugins for Google Map. Jeffrey did a fantastic job building this out. You can do just about anything. I have some examples in my fourth part of my article of even taking a route developed and built uh, in uh, GeoJSON format in a completely different package, in a completely different uh, method. And simply because of what Jeffrey's been able to do, dropped it directly into this Google Maps API iframe and immediately had it displayed on the screen. And in case you don't believe me, just to share it with you, here's the pending merchandise requests, exactly the same thing. My friends, that's a live Google map screen. I can drill into it. I can click on any one of these things to see what the address is that I'm delivering to. And again, color coded to tell me, if I remember correctly, green is a small sign, red's a big sign, and blue is some sort of merchandise. So I'm almost done. I've got just a few minutes left here. Whoops, let me go back here. I do have several pieces of documentation for you, but I do have one last thing to share with you. By the way, here's the latest version, as far as I know, of the Apex plugin. But if I remember correctly, uh, Jeffrey also did recently release a newer version, either just as he joined Oracle or just as he left. Do spend some time, by the way, on the SQL query examples if you're using an older version of his because uh, you have to build the query precisely right. My understanding is in the newer release, it's not quite as picky about that, but I spent a good afternoon for about two hours trying to figure out why I couldn't get that map to display. So take some time to definitely look at that. By the way, I recently did three two-minute tech tips on using geolocation and spatial as well as graph features. And one final thing I want to share with you from my application, and then I promise I'm done. I built this today because I wanted to take a look at some voter demographics in my district. And this is the results of a very simple query and a very simple set of graphs. This is actually a bubble chart. And what I'm really displaying here is the potential of people that are interested in voting as a Democrat in our particular district. And so the size of the bubble, the size of the circle in this case, represents the number of people in different age ranges between 35 and 40, 40 and 45 and so forth, and their gender, green male, female blue. And you can see how nice this is. This is, I don't have to learn Tableau. I don't have to buy another package. This is all inside Apex, folks. This is using the chart mechanism. And I used a similar one to break out male and female voters within gender. I put this together 
literally this morning in about two hours. It took a little bit to figure out how to do the bubbles and everything else, but once I figured that out, I was able to do this in basically no time at all. My point is, and I do have one, Apex makes it extremely simple to access data, even machine learning models, because remember, they're schema objects within my database and leverage these tools extremely effectively, these objects extremely effectively. Again, I don't necessarily need Oracle Analytics Cloud. There's a lot more advanced uh, methods and, and uh, other things inside Oracle Analytics Cloud. I'm not saying don't use it if you've got it, but be aware that Apex can do a lot of the things that are already there. And remember, Apex is free. It doesn't cost a dime to use it. And with that, my friends, I am uh, finished. And now, if you have any questions, I'd certainly love to hear them. If you're, I know I'm standing between you and Cerveza or whatever your favorite drink is, wherever you are, right? <laughs> Maybe a nice Mendoza and Vino, right? Whatever. Uh, or a nice Carmen Air. Oh, I love Carmen Air. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you didn't try here where, where you, when you were here in Paraguay, you didn't try Caña Paraguaya, really? Say that again, please. Caña Paraguaya. It's something like vodka, but <sighs> it is more refined. Oh, I remember that. Oh, yeah. Really good. Really. Yes. Uh, what okay, I really do love. I, I think that, sorry. What I really do love is that as I went through all the Southern South American countries, everyone claimed to have the best meat at all the churrascarios. I thought that was great. <laughs> but but anyway. everybody knows the best meat is in Paraguay. Everybody knows that. Yes, I know. It's crazy. Um, so do I know any, I, there were a couple questions here. Um, unfortunately, yeah. one's in Spanish. from. Papalina. I think they are all congratulations. Oh, they are. Okay, good, good. Um, uh, thank very you for interesting. The, yes. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay. If you have any questions, I will be sending the presentation back to the group. Thank you for okay. having me. It was wonderful. A anything else thank that you. I can do for you guys? Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time. Gracias a todos por acompañarnos y los esperamos el lunes en las primeras presentaciones a partir de las 10 de la mañana hora México. Muchas gracias a todos y hasta luego. Bye, Jim. Hasta luego.